Welcome back everyone to SuperCloud 22, live in the Palo Alto office, our stage performance, we're streaming virtually. It's our pilot event, our inaugural event, SuperCloud 22. I'm John Furrier with my co-host Dave Vellante. Got a featured keynote uh, conversation with Kit Colbert, who's the CTO of VMware. Got to lay it all out, break it down. Kit, great to see you. Thanks for Thank joining you. us for SuperCloud 20, our inaugural event. Yeah, I'm excited <laughs> to be here. Thanks for having me. So we had great distinguished panels coming up through. Um, we heard Vittorio earlier to the keynote. Mm -hmm. There's a shift happening. The shift yep. has happened, that's called cloud. <laughs> um, you just published a white paper that kind of brings out these new challenges around the complexity of how companies want to run their business. Yep. It's not born in the cloud, it's cloud everywhere. Seems to be the theme. What's your take on super cloud? What's the roadmap for multi-cloud? Yeah, well, <clears throat> you know, the reason that we got interested in this was just talking to our customers. And the reality is, Everybody is using multiple clouds uh, today, multiple public clouds, they got things on-prem, they got stuff at the edge. And so their applications are essentially distributed everywhere. And the challenges they start running into there is that there's just a lot of heterogeneity there. There's like different APIs, different capabilities, uh, inconsistencies, incompatibilities in terms of workload placement, data, migration, security, uh, as we just heard about, et cetera. And so I think everyone's struggling with trying to figure out how do I drive consistency across all that diversity? And what sort of consistency do I want? And one of the things that became really interesting in our conversations with customers is that <clears throat> there is no one size fits all, that different folks are in different places and the types of consistency that they want to prioritize will be different based on their individual business requirements. And so this started forming a picture for us saying, okay, <clears throat> what we need are a set of capabilities of you know, multi-cloud, cross-cloud services that deliver that consistency across all the different environments where their applications may be running. And that is what formed the, the early thinking and uh, sort of the paper that, that we wrote on it as well as some of the work. And that I think eventually leads to this vision of super cloud, right? Because I think you guys have the right idea, which is, <clears throat> hey, how does all this stuff come together? And, and what does that bigger picture look like? And so I think between the sort of the, the native services that are there individually for each cloud that offer great value, by the way, and people definitely should be taking advantage of, in addition to another set of services, which are multi-cloud that go across clouds and provide that consistency, looking at that together, that's in my picture where the super cloud is. So the, the paper's called The Era of Multi-Cloud Services Arrive, VMware Executive Outlook for IT Leaders and Decision Makers, I'm sure you can get on your website. Yep. And in there, you talked about, well, first of all, I think you would agree that multi-cloud has fundamentally been a, system, a symptom of multi-vendor or m and I mean, you yeah. talked about that, that in the paper, right? Yeah. It, it was never really a strategy. It was just like, hey, we woke up in the 2020s and here we are with multiple <laughs> clouds, right? Yeah, it was one of those situations where most folks that we talked to didn't plan to be multi-cloud. Uh, now that's changed a little bit in the past year or two, sure. but certainly in the earlier days of cloud, people would go all in saying, hey, I'm going to go all in on uh, one, one of the major hyperscalers and, and uh, go for it there. And that's great and offers a lot of advantages, right? There is internal consistency there. There's usually pretty good integration between their services, so on and so forth. Uh, the problem though that you start facing is that, to your point, uh, acquisitions. You acquire companies using a different cloud. Well, so, okay, now I got two different clouds. <clears throat> or sometimes you have the phenomenon of shadow IT still happening, where some random line of business is going to go off and use a different cloud for yeah. whatever reason. Uh, the other thing that we've seen is that over time that you may have standardized on one, but then over time, technology changes, another cloud makes major advancements uh, in the state of the art or, you know, let's say in machine learning, and you say, hey, I want to go to this other cloud for that. So what we start to see is that people now are choosing public clouds uh, based on best of breed service capabilities and that they're going to make those decisions in a fairly fine-grained manner, right? Sometimes down to the, the team, the line of business, et cetera. <clears throat> and so this is where customers you know, and companies find themselves now. It's like, oh boy, I now have all these clouds. And what's happened is that they kind of dealt with it in an ad hoc manner. They would spin up uh, individual operations teams, uh, security teams, et cetera, that specialized in each of the clouds. They had knowledge about how to do that. But now people found that, okay, I'm duplicating all this. There's not really consistency in, in my approach here. Is there a better way? And I think this is, again, the advent of a lot of the thinking of multi-cloud services and super cloud. And I think one of the things too, in listening to you talk is that the old model used to be, you know, solve complexity with more complexity. Okay, <laughs> yes. and customers don't want that <clears throat> from what we're observing. And what you're saying is they've seen the benefits of DevOps, DevSecOps, so they know yep. the value. Yep. 
because they've been on say one native cloud. Now they say, okay, I'm on premise. And we heard from Vittorio said, there's a lot of private cloud going on, mm -hmm. which essentially makes that another cloud out by default as well. Yep. So hybrid is multi-cloud. Hy hybrid is a subset, yeah. Hybrid <laughs> is like, we kind of had this evolution of thinking, right? Where you kind of had all the sort of uh, different locations. And then we're, I think hybrid was an attempt to say, okay, let's try to connect uh, one location or a set of locations on premises with a public cloud <clears throat> and have some level of consistency there. But really what we look at here with multi-cloud or super cloud is that that's really a generalization of that. We're not talking about one or two locations on-prem and one cloud. We're talking about everything now. And <clears throat> moreover, I think hybrid cloud tended to focus a lot on sort of core infrastructure and management. This looks across the board. We're talking about security. We're talking about application development, talking about end user experience, things like zero trust. We're talking about infrastructure, data. So you know, it goes much, much broader, I think, than when we talked about hybrid cloud a few years ago. So in your paper, you've, you've essentially, Kit, laid out an early framework, let's call it, yep. for, uh, for what we call super cloud, what you call you know, cross cloud services. So what, what do you see as the technical enablers that are, you know, the, the salient aspects of, again, multi-cloud or, or super cloud? Yep. <clears throat> well, so for me, it comes down to, um, so okay, taking a step back, <clears throat> so we have this problem, right, where you have a lot of diversity across different clouds and customers are looking for some levels of consistency. But as I said, rarely do I see two customers that want exactly the same types of consistency. <clears throat> and so what, what we try to do is to step back and first of all, establish a taxonomy. And that, by, that, by that I mean, what are the different types of consistency that you might want? And so there's things around infrastructure, consistency, uh, security consistency, software supply chain security is a, probably the, the top of mind one that I hear from customers. <clears throat> application uh, and uh, application services, so things like databases, messaging, streaming services, AI and L services, et cetera, uh, and user capabilities, and then of course data as well. And so you know, in the paper we, we say, okay, here's these kind of five areas of consistency. And that's the, the first piece. The second one then turns more to an architectural question of what exactly is a multi-cloud service. What does that mean for a cloud service to be multi-cloud and, and what, what are the properties there? So essentially we said, okay, we see three different types of those. There's one where that service could run on a single cloud but could support multiple clouds. Mm -hmm. So think about, for instance, a service that does uh, cost analysis. Now it may have, you know, maybe executing on AWS, let's say, but it can do cost analysis for Azure or Google or AWS or anybody, right? So that's the first type. The second type, is a bit more advanced where now you're saying I can actually instantiate that same service into multiple clouds. <clears throat> and we see that oftentimes with things like databases that have a lot of performance, latency, et cetera, requirements and that you can't be accessing that database remotely. That doesn't, you know, from a different cloud that's going to be too slow. You want to be in, it, have it on the same cloud that you're in. And so again, you see uh, various uh, vendors out there implementing that where that database can be instantiated wherever you'd like. And then the third one <clears throat> would be going even further. And this is where we really get into some of the more, much more difficult use cases where customers uh, want a workload to be on-prem. And sometimes, especially for those that are uh, you know, very regulatory compliant, they may need it even in an air-gapped or disconnected environment. Mm -hmm. So there can you take that same service, but now run it without your operators being able to manage it 24-7. You know, so those are the three categories. So a single cloud supporting, a single cloud instance supporting multiple clouds, multi-cloud instance, multi-cloud instance disconnected. So you're abstracting, you as the, you know, the R&D arm, you're abstracting that complexity. How do you handle this problem where you've got one cloud maybe has a better service than the yep. other clouds? Do you have to devolve to the lowest common denominator or, yeah. or how do you mask that? Well, we, so that's a really good question. <clears throat> and we've debated it and there's been a lot of thought on it. Our current point of view is that we really want to leave it up to the, the company themselves to make that decision. Again, because we see different use cases. So for instance, I talk to customers in the defense sector and they are like, hey, you know, if a foreign adversary is attacking one of these public clouds that we're in, we got to be able to evacuate our applications from there, sometimes in minutes, right? Uh, in order to maintain our operational capabilities. <clears throat> and so there, there, there does need to be a least common denominator approach just because of that uh, requirement. I see other folks, you know, you look at the financial banking industries, they're also regulated. I think for them, it's oftentimes 90 days to get out of the cloud. So they can do a little bit of re-architecture. You got time to roll the sleeves and, and change some things. So maybe it's not quite as strict. Whereas other companies say, you know what? I want to take advantage of these best of breed services native to the clouds. Um, <clears throat> so we don't uh, try to prescribe a certain approach there, but we say you got to align it with what your business requirements are. 
How about the PaaS layer? So one of the things we've said is that we felt like a, a super PaaS was a, was a requirement of, of <laughs> yeah. a super cloud because yep. it's, a, it's a purpose built PaaS that, that, that helps you with that objective, whatever that is. And you say in the paper, for developers, each cloud provider has unique infrastructure, interfaces, and APIs that add work and slow the pace of their releases. For operators, each additional cloud increases the complexity of their architecture, fragmenting security, performance, optimization, and cost management. Yep. So, so are you building a, a super pass? What's your philosophy? You, you know, Vittorio said, have, we want to have our cake, we want to eat it too, and we want to lose weight. So <laughs> how do you do that? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so I think it's, so first things first, you know, what the paper is trying to present in the end is really sort of an architectural point of view on how to approach this, right? And then, yeah, we at VMware, we've got a lot of solutions towards some of those things, <clears throat> but we also realize we can't do everything ourselves, right? The, the space is too large. So it's very much a, a partner strategy there. Um, <clears throat> now that being said, on, on things like on the PaaS side, you know, we are doing a lot for instance, around Tanzu, mm -hmm. which is our modern apps portfolio products. And the focus there really is to, yes, provide some of that consistency across different clouds, enabling customers to take advantage of either cross-cloud PaaS type services or cloud native, uh, or native cloud services, I should say. And so we really give customers that choice. And I think that's for us where it's at, because again, we don't see it as a one size fits all. So there's your cake and eat it too. <laughs> so you're saying the developer experience can be identical across clouds yep. unless the developers don't want it to be. Yeah, and maybe the team makes that decision. Look, there, there's a lot of reasons why you may want to make that or may not. Mm -hmm. um, the reality is that these native cloud services do add a lot of value and oftentimes are very easy to consume, to get started with, yep. to get going. And so, you know, it's a trade off you got to think about. And I don't think there's a right answer. So, Ken, I got to ask on you, you said you can't do it alone. Yep. VMware. I know for a fact you guys have been working on this for many, many years. Yep. Ragu, I remember I interviewed him in 2016 when he did the deal with AWS with Andy Jassy. That really moved the needle. Things got yep. really great from there with VMware. So would you would you be open to a consortium to oversee? Because you guys have a lot of, lot of investment in this mm -hmm. as a company. <clears throat> but I also don't hear you trying to do the lock-in thing. Um, so <laughs> yeah. would you guys be open to a consortium to kind of try to figure out what these building blocks look like, or is it a bag of Legos is what people want? Absolutely, and, and you know, what, what we offer in the, in the paper is really just a starting point. It's pretty simple. We're trying to define a, a few basic items of the taxonomy and, and some outline sketches, if you will, of, of what that architectural picture might look like. But it's very much that, like just a starting point. And <clears throat> this is not something we can do alone. This is something that we really need the entire industry to rally around. Because again, I, th I think what's important here are standards. Yeah. That, that there's got to be uh, this sort of decomposition of functionality, a breakdown in the different sort of logical layers of functionality. What do those APIs or interfaces look like? How do we ensure interoperability? Because we do want people to be able to get the best of breed, to be able to bring together different vendor solutions to enable that. And, and I was watching, uh, AWS had a silicon um, a day just last week, talking about their advances in silicon. Mm -hmm. um, what's your guys' position on that? Because you're seeing the IaaS players <clears throat> almost getting more niche and more better yep. at the hardware yep. matters more. Silicon, speed, latency, GPUs. Yeah. So that seems to me be an enabler opportunity for the ecosystem to innovate mm -hmm. at the pass and SaaS relationship. Where, where do you guys see, uh, where are you guys, um, strong and where do you need work to do on? If you had to say there was some white space sure. that VMware, let me say, hey, we, lot, we own this area, we, we're solid here. Here's some white spaces that VMware could use some help with. Yeah, well, I think the, the infrastructure space you just mentioned is clearly one <laughs> that, that we've been focused on for a long time. Uh, we're expanding into the, the modern app space, expanding into security. Uh, we've been strong and end user for a while. <clears throat> so a lot of the different uh, multi-cloud capabilities, we've actually been, to your point, developing for a while. And I think that's exactly, again, what went into this. Like, what we started noticing was all of our different product teams were reacting to the same thing. And we weren't necessarily talking about it together like yet. They're, like what? <clears throat> well, this, this whole challenge of multiple clouds, of dealing with that heterogeneity, of wanting choice and flexibility into where to place a workload or where to place a virtual desktop or you know whatever it might be. And so each of the teams was responding individually. 
to that customer feedback. And so I think what, what we recognized was like, hey, let's, let's up-level this, and what's the bigger picture, and what's the sort of common architecture across all of it, right? So I think that, that's what the, the really interesting aspect here was, is that this is very much driven by what we're hearing directly from customers. You, you kind of implied just recently that, you know, the, the, the paper was pretty straightforward, pretty basic, early days, yep. but, but it's well thought out. And one of the things you talked about was the type of, of, of uh, multi-cloud services. Yep. You had data plane, end user services, security, infrastructure, which is your wheelhouse and application services. Yep. So, and you sort of def went into you know, detail defining those. Where is management in all that? Yeah. So these are the ones you're going after. <laughs> what about management? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so it's a really good question. We debated this for a long time. Does management actually get a separate uh, sort of layer uh, that you could, we could add a, a sixth one, mm -hmm. perhaps, or is it, is it sort of baked in mm -hmm. to the different ones? And we kind of went with the latter, where it's sort of baked in. There's infrastructure management, there's modern app management, um, <clears throat> there's management and users. It's kind of management, you know, for each security, obviously. So we see a lot of different management planes, control planes across each of those different layers. Now, does there need to be a separate one uh, that has its own layer? Arguably, yes. I mean, I, I, I think there are good arguments for that, and this is exactly why. We put this out there, though, is to like get people to, to read it, get people to give, give us feedback. And going back to the consortium idea, let's come together as a, a group of practitioners across the industry to really figure out an industry viewpoint on this. So what are the trade-offs there? So the, you, what would be the benefit of having that separate layer? What, 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 I presume it's simpler to do it the way you've done it, but what would be the benefit yeah. of having a separate layer? I think it was probably more about simplicity to yeah. start with. Mm -hmm. Like you could imagine like 20 different layers, yeah. and, <laughs> and maybe that's yeah. you know, where it's going to go. Um, but also, I think it's, um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think it's how do you define the layer? And for us, it was more around sort of the, some of these functional aspects as an infrastructure versus application level right. versus end user. Mm -hmm. And management is more of a commonality across those. But again, I, I could see so arguments. It's a logical made. place to start. Yeah. The, the other thing you said in here multi cloud application services can route requests for a particular service, such as a database, and deploy the service on the correct individual cloud using the most appropriate technology for the use case, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. That to me sounds like a metadata pr problem. <clears throat> and, and so can you talk about how you, you've approached that? You mentioned yep. AWS RDS, great examples Azure S a SQL, an Oracle database, et cetera, et cetera, multiple yep. endpoints. H how do you approach that? Yeah. Well, I think there's a bunch of different approaches there. And um, so again, so the idea is that, and you know, I, I know there's been reference to sort of like the operating system for <laughs> SuperCloud. What does that look yeah. like, right? But I think, it totally, you know, we, we don't actually use that term, but I, I do like the, the concept of an operating system. Because mm -hmm. a lot of things that you just talk about there, these are things operating systems do. You got to have a scheduler. And so you, you look across <clears throat> uh, many different clouds and you got to figure out, okay, where do I actually want in this case, let's say a database instance to go and be provisioned. And then really it's up to, I think, the vendor or the, 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 this, in this case, the multi-cloud service creator to define how they want to do that. They could leverage the native cloud services or they could build their own technology, right, which a lot of the, the vendors are doing. And so <clears throat> the point though, is that really you get this, from an end user standpoint, it goes back to your complexity, simplicity question. You get the simplicity of a single API that the implementation you don't really need to deal with because you're like, I'm getting a service, and I need the database and it has certain properties and I want it here versus there versus wherever. But it's up to that multi-cloud service to figure out a lot of those implementation specifics. So are you the super cloud OS? <clears throat> I think it is uh, VMware's goal to become the super cloud OS for sure. But you know, like any good operating system, as we said, like uh, it's all about applications, right? So you have, you, have the, you have a platform point of view, but you got to partner widely. And, and you got to get the hardware relationship, yes. the silicon chips, yep. right. <clears throat> yeah, and actually, that was a good point. I want to go back to that one. You mentioned that earlier, the innovation that we're seeing, you know, things like uh, ARM processors and like Graviton and a lot of these things mm -hmm. happening. And so I think that's another really interesting area where you're seeing tremendous innovation there in the public cloud. One of the challenges though for public cloud is actually at scale and that it takes longer to release newer hardware at that scale. So in some cases, if you want bleeding edge stuff, you can't go with public cloud because it's just not there yet, right? <clears throat> and so that's again another interesting thing where you. you, you <laughs> well, some will say that they launch five thousand new services every year at AWS. <laughs> no, they, but I'm talking. They have some yeah. bleeding edge stuff. Well, wait, no, no, no. Sorry, sorry, yeah, let, let me clarify. Let me clarify. Okay. I'm not talking about the software side. I'm talking right. about the hardware okay, side. Okay, got it. Okay. So, but like the silicon. Yeah, like you know the latest and greatest GPU, FPGA. Why? Why can't they? Because uh, they because they do like. 
tens of thousands of them, hundreds of thousands of them. In order oh, just to, because it's, it's so many. It's the scale. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's yeah. the point, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 right. <clears throat> and it's, it's, uh, it's fundamental to the model, right, in, yeah. in terms of how big they are. And so that's why we do see some customers who need, who have very specialized hardware requirements, need to do it in the private cloud, right, on-prem, uh, or possibly at a colo. Or Edge. Or Edge, a right? Edge is a great example of. Uh, but we often see, again, people like, you know, the latest bleeding edge GPUs, whatever they are, even something a bit more experimental, that they're going to go on-prem on for that. Yeah. And so, look, we're not, I'm not, I do not want to disparage the public cloud, so please don't take that away. It's just an artifact when it gets to hard, like software they can scale and they do. Well, it's in context of the OS quickly. conversation. OS has to write to hardware and enable applications. Where I yeah. was getting caught up in that is, kid, is the, they're all developing their own silicon and they're developing yes. it, at a play, most yep. of it's ARM based and they're developing yep. it in a much, much faster cycle. They can go from design to tape out much faster than Intel yep. historically has. And yep. you know, you're seeing it. You know, Intel just posted a lot. Yeah, but, I, but, think, but, I think if you look at the overall system, you're absolutely right. Yeah, but it's, um, the, it's the deployment <clears throat> because of the scale, because that one availability zone and yeah. another and another region, and that's... Well, yeah, but uh, so a, a counterpoint to what I just said would be, hey, like, <clears throat> they have very well-controlled environments, very well-controlled systems, so they don't need to support a million different configuration settings or whatever. <clears throat> They've got theirs that they use, right? Yeah. And so from a system standpoint and uh, so forth, yeah, I agree that there's a lot they can do there. I was speaking specifically to, you know, different types of hardware accelerators, uh, being yeah. a bit of a, a, a bottle. If it's there. not in the 5,000 services that they offer, you can't get it. Whereas on-prem, you can say, I want that, yeah. here it is. I, I, and I'm not saying that on-prem is necessarily fundamentally better in any way. I'm just saying for this particular area. It's use case driven. It is, and that's the whole point of all of this, right? Yeah. Like, um, and I know, you know, a lot of people in their heads associate VMware with on-prem, but we are not dogmatic at all. And, you know, as you guys know, but many, many people may not, like we partner with all the public cloud sure. hyperscalers. Yeah. And so <clears throat> our point of view is very much, much more nuanced saying, look, we're happy to run workloads wherever you want to. In fact, that's what we hear from customers. They want to run them everywhere. But it's about finding the right tool for the right job. And, I think and that's what really what this multi-cloud approach yeah, is about. Yeah, and I think the structural change of the virtualization hypervisor, this new shift to V2, super cloud, there's something happening fundamentally yeah. Yeah. that's use case driven. It's not about dogma and whatever. I mean, cloud's great, <clears throat> but native clouds have the pros and cons. And I would say that super cloud, a prerequisite for super cloud has got to be running in a, in a public cloud, but I'd say it also has to be inclusive of on-prem data. Yes, absolutely. And, and you're not going to just move all that data into the cloud, maybe in the fullness of time, but I don't personally believe that. But you look at what Goldman Sachs has done with AWS, yeah. they've got their on-prem data and they're connecting to the AWS cloud. Yep. What, what Walmart's doing with Azure, and that's going to happen in a lot of different industries. Yeah. You know? Well, I think security will drive that too. We had that conversation because no one wants to increase the surface area, number one. They want complexity to be reduced and they want economic benefits. Yep. That's the super cloud yep. kind of. It's a security, but it's also a differentiable advantage that you actually have on prem that you don't necessarily. All right, well, we're going to debate this now. Kit, thank you for <laughs> okay. uh, coming on and giving that keynote. We're going to have a, a panel to debate and discuss the blockers and enablers to super cloud. Uh, and, and there are some enablers and yep. potentially blockers. Yep, absolutely. So we'll get into that. Okay, up next, the panel to discuss blockers and enablers of super cloud after this quick break. <laughs>